Dear participants, dear colleagues, a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. My name is Julio Pinto. I am working in the Food and Agriculture Organization as an animal health officer with the One Health and Disease Control Branch of the Animal Production and Health Division and based in the FAO office in Geneva. I would like to give you a warm welcome to this FAO One Health Dialogue organized by FAO Office in Geneva and the FAO Animal Production and Health Division through the FAO One Health Technical Working Group in coordination with the Forestry Division. Before starting our event, allow me to share some details regarding the logistic and housekeeping for this virtual discussions. The webinar will be in English with no interpretation. It will be recorded and later all the information will be available in our website. Uh, <clears throat> please, if you have any questions, raise your question, write your questions in the question and answer module, another regular chat box, and can this state your name and organization or institution. Without further delay, please allow me to now to jump right into the subject matter of the webinar today. The topic of today's dialogue is upstream prevention for the merging and spillover of pathogens. Preventions include addressing the drivers of disease emergence, namely ecological, meteorological, and anthropogenic factors and activities that increase spillover risk in order to reduce the risk of human infection. The One Health High Level Expert Panel, OLEP, an advisory body of the quadripartite organizations, proposed the following definition of prevention. Prevention of pathogen spillover from animals to humans means shifting the infectious disease control paradigm from reactive to proactive, including primary prevention. Prevention is informed by, amongst other actions, biosurveillance in natural host, people and environment, understanding pathogen infection dynamics, and implementing intervention activities. Building on the lessons learned from the implementation of the One Health approach, and with the presence of FAO experts from the Forestry Division, the Animal Production and Health Divisions, and key institutions as partners, this One Health dialogue will showcase concrete examples of how the One Health approach offers an holistic solution to safeguard our precious forest and thus contribute to agri-food system transformation. We will start the discussion on exploring how to tackle health threats at the human-wildlife interface with examples of One Health solutions from the approach and results from the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program that will be presented by Sandra Rati Arison, Forestry Officer of FAO. Then we will hear from Sib Noga, Secretary General, Preventing Zoonotic Disease Emergency Initiative, PRESOT, who will present this initiative as an innovative international program with ambition to understand the risk of emergence of zoonotic infectious diseases to develop and implement innovative methods to improve prevention, early detection, and resilience in order to ensure rapid response to the risk of emerging infectious diseases of animal origin. After that, we will zoom in on very concrete examples of One Health implementations experienced in Guyana and Zambia, presented by our colleagues Brian Punu, One Health Component Coordinator of the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program in Guyana, and also from our colleague Griffin Chanungu, coordinator of the Sustainable Wildlife Man Management Program in Zambia. During the second part of this webinar, our colleagues Juan Diaz Naki, Program Management Officer from UNEP, who is member of the Quadripartite Collaboration, will facilitate a dynamic dialogue and interaction with our speakers and all participants. We will close this webinar with the final remarks from Tana Watkinson, Director of the Animal Production and Health Division and Chief Veterinarian of FAO. And now let's start with our program. And I will 
uh, invite to take the floor to Sandra Ratiarison, forestry officer, FAO, to see the scene for today's discussion. Sandra, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Do you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, we can. So I'm, so I'm Sandra Ratierison. Uh, thank you, uh, Gilio. Uh, I'm forestry officer for, for FAO based in sub-regional office for Central Africa in, uh, in Gabon and working as a regional coordinator for the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program. And today, with this presentation to set the scene for this webinar, I will share with you some of our ongoing and uh, our recent work involving various uh, FAO's departments to promote the one else approach to addressing zoonotic risk at the human-animal interface through upstream prevention with a focus on the sustainable wildlife management program. <coughs> Sorry. Upstream prevention involves interventions of, uh, at the level of ecosystems where zoonotic agents originate or circulate at and at interfaces between wild animals, humans, and domestic animals. As a reminder, uh, most emerging diseases uh, are zoonoses, primarily originating from wildlife or having wildlife as hosts. Epidemics and pandemics of emerging zoonoses often results from uh, biolog biological risks posed by viruses, but also bacteria and parasites present in natural ecosystems where they circulate uh, enzootically among reserve of species without causing disease. Transmission to domestic animals or humans can occur through vectors or close contact, leading to epizootics or human infections. Increased human encroachment on ecosystems, which alters eco landscapes and affect all species or vectors, as well as specific behaviors like hunting or keeping wild animal as pets, enhance these risks. Additionally, human social behaviors and travel can amplify human-to-human -human transmission, potentially leading to epidemics and pandemics. For example, the monkey virus, uh, monkeypox virus uh, starts with rodents infecting primates and then humans, demonstrating the importance of a One Health approach. Recent evidence from Uganda indicates also that deforestation for tobacco altering animal feeding behavior potentially increased disease risk. Though no spillover evidence exists yet, this underscores how the ecosystem changes can affect risk factors. <coughs> At FAO, we prevent the emergence and spread of zoonotic pathogens through various field and policy interventions to maintain ecosystem health. Especially, we support efforts to halt degradation and restore lands globally through the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration Program in collaboration with the UN, UN Environment Program, as well as RED programs. In 2022, FAO and EcoHealth Eco Alliance produced a, a policy brief on the role of natural resource management in reducing the risk and impact of emerging infectious diseases, focusing on forest ecosystems. Based on FAO guidance, the brief includes eight recommendations for national agencies and stakeholders in environmental management and land use planning. Some of these, the key recommendations include share data and collaborate with public and animal health sectors on One Health initiatives, participate in evidence-based disease risk assessments, incorporate emerging infectious disease considerations into forest management policies, pra practices, standards, and regulation. I'll put the link to this paper at the end of this uh, presentation. To maintain ecosystem health, we address human wildlife conflicts through several key areas. First, policy and advocacy. We've been active in including human wildlife conflict in the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and developing a specific indicator for target four. 
Next, we focus on good practices and knowledge exchange, preparing 25 field case studies to showcase diverse approaches to managing human wildlife conflict and fostering a coexistence. These case studies span multiple countries providing best practices for human wildlife mitigation. The final tool will be published this year. We also provide technical support for field projects in Tanzania, Central Africa, and Zimbabwe, and emphasize communication and outreach through infographics and publications. We are addressing human wildlife conflict in partnership with 13 international organizations and biodiversity related conventions under the Collaborative Partnership on Sustainable Wildlife Management, so called CPW, specifically through initiative three of the CPW work plan. Further work on human wildlife conflict will follow the mandate from the 24th African Forestry and Wildlife Commission and the FAO Action Plan to mainstream biodiversity across agricultural sector 2024-2027. For upstream prevention, we also promote sustainable wildlife management to restore and maintain healthy wildlife population through participatory models involving communities living near wildlife contributing to biodiversity con conservation and human wildlife well-being, human well-being, sorry, mostly via the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program. Finally, we work on maintaining human and animal health through technical information sharing and one health capacity building to reduce zoonotic pathogen spillover along wild, the wild meat value chain, especially through the, the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program again. During the COVID-19 crisis, we published policy and technical briefs on zoonotic risk associated with wildlife and recommendation to mitigate those risks. Let's focus now on the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program, which uh, addresses uh, wildlife use, mostly consumptive ones. The Sustainable Wildlife Management Program, or SWM, uh, works at country level focusing on the trade in free-ranging wildlife species hunted for wild meat in countries where many local communities and indigenous people still rely heavily on wild meat for food and income. But where urban consumption of wild meat is increasing, severely depleting wildlife populations in some areas, threatening the viability of wildlife populations and the food security of the most vulnerable, and increasing public health risk, including epidemics of zoonoses and livestock diseases. Indeed, pathogens have been identified at different levels of wildlife supply chains, and some handling and processing practices have been linked to emerging zoonoses. To address those issues, the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program has been launched in 2017, this is an initiative funded by the European Union with co-funding from the French Global Environment Facility and the French Development Agency. It's led by FAO and implemented in partnership with the International Center on Research and Forestry and Agroforestry, c 4 ecraft the International Center for Research in Agronomy for Development, CIRAD, and the Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS. Operating in 14 countries worldwide across diverse socio-ecosystems, including forests, savannas, and wetlands, are collaborative efforts with national authorities and more than 80 local communities aim to develop and implement innovative, scalable models of sustainable wildlife management. Originally, our objectives were to enhance management of hunting, fishing, and wildlife habitats by local communities, promote sustainable consumption of wild meat by reducing demand, especially in urban areas, and improve legal and institutional frameworks to support these goals. Until March 2020, health risks related to wild meat were secondary in the program. However, the COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the link between wildlife and zoonotic diseases, urging us to assess and mitigate future pandemic risks. During the first lockdown, we convened 25 experts to produce a white paper on and policy brief titled Build Back Better in the Post-COVID-19 World, Reducing Future Wildlife-Borne Spillover Diseases to Human, outlining priorities to prevent zoonotic risk along wild meat value chains. 
With additional EU funding, we launched a new One Health component to strengthen national capacities in preventing, detecting, and responding to health risk in the wild meat sector. Our goal is to enhance awareness of wildlife-related health risk and empower stakeholders across various sectors of the One Health approach to address them effectively. Within the SWM program, the One Health approach is embedded in almost all of its components, integrating efforts to enhance ecosystem, animal, and human health. This includes promoting sustainable wildlife management to restore or maintain wildlife population, thereby improving ecosystem health, as well as reducing zoonotic risk for public health by mitigating those risks along the wild meat value chains from forest to fog. I'll focus on the latter strategies that include improving zoonotic risk assessments for prioritizing risk management actions, establishing participatory surveillance systems at human wildlife livestock interfaces, enhancing for safety practices and real regulatory frameworks, especially in regions where wild meat trade is illegal, addressing human demand for wild meat through targeted behavior change campaigns. The two latest strategy alone uh, also align with efforts the SWM program is supporting to develop accessible and safe alternative sources of proteins, and more broadly, with FAO's broader goal of transforming food systems inclusively. Regarding the first strategy to improve zoonotic risk assessments for prioritizing risk management actions, we have undergone thorough analysis of value, wildlife value chains with varying focuses depending on countries. For instance, we included pets in Guyana, where wild bird international trade is an important economic activity that raises concerns regarding avian influenza. In Central Africa, we have focused on wild meat value chain in general, and in countries where specific species known to be risky are traded and consumed, we have ca carried out specific studies on supply on those supply chains. This is the case, for instance, in the Republic of Congo, where bats are con consumed for meat by the most vulnerable population through less visible trade networks. All this information on those wildlife value chains can help identifying hotspots of pathogen spillover for from wildlife to humans, where subsequent risk prevention or mitigation measures can be put in place. And we provide targeted recommendations for priority risk management. Risk management is essential because pathogens can be everywhere and there also are there are also pathogens in the wild that we do not even know and are first unable to detect. It is impossible and too costly to test for pathogens presence randomly, so information on such practices and associated risk are essential to prioritize public health investment effectively. In Gabon, we are piloting risk-based battery surveillance and early warning systems, leveraging trust with partner communities. We are setting up a zoonotic disease surveillance system at the human-animal interface. We are looking at creating a virtuous, virtuous circle of community involvement with investigations of alerts, feedback, and support measures in response that should gradually raise awareness of the zoonotic risk and the collective benefits of surveillance. So far, we've assessed national capacities across human and animal health sectors and co-designed a community-based surveillance system involving hunters, communities, national research institutions, and local health services. Communities were sensitized to zoonotic risk and trained to detect cases using serious games. We also started to engage with more actors from the forestry sector so as to increase the geographic coverage of surveillance. The pilot system validated by local health authorities launched, was launched in three partner communities in 2023 and expanded to, expanded to two more co communities. Its effectiveness is evaluated through a PhD traces, providing scaling up recommendations. Discussions with human health services aim to ensure community involvement in a one health surveillance system, enhancing zoonotic risk management. Based on this experience and other from other initiatives, we'll be extending this work to other countries, especially Congo uh, and Madagascar. 
In multiple countries, we've studied cultural and economic drivers of wild meat consumption, as well as hygiene and food safety practices along the wild meat value chains. For customers, we've identified target audiences likely to change behavior and crafted sensitive messages for social marketing campaigns now underway. These campaigns will need repetition over a long period of time, potentially decades. So we're collaborating with local partners for sustainability. For Wild Meat Trade actors, we're providing training on safer hygiene and food safety practices. Additionally, we are working with authorities to develop legislation that addresses wild meat health risk and to organize a legal wild meat trade sector that better acknowledges um, and mitigates these risks. To enhance the implementation of the One Health approach, we are strengthening health capacities to address wild animal health, which often receives little attention in our target countries. We've assessed One Health and wildlife health capacities in government and non-government organizations. Additionally, we've conducted legal cross-sectoral analysis to identify weaknesses and opportunities for improving coordination and collaboration among, among One Health sectors. We support One Health coordination platforms, such as the one in Guyana, which will be discussed later in this webinar. So this is an overview of what we've been doing. Uh, Brian and uh, uh, Griffin will present more uh, specific one in a uh, future presentation in this webinar. Thank you very much. If you want more information, you can scan this, uh, this code uh, to reach the SWM website. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for, for this very comprehensive uh, and complete presentation with a lot of good information and details on the different initiatives, including the sustainable wildlife management and also other global initiatives that are addressing uh, the issue of, of wildlife, uh, sustainable wildlife management, and addressing these human wildlife conflicts. Um, I just, we need to move with the program and, and, and I will now give the floor to our second speaker, which is Steve Noga from Presot Initiative. Uh, Steve will give us a, an overview of the activities of the Presot and what Presot is doing today in addressing these uh, issues related to prevention and the emergence of zoonotic diseases at the animal. Uh, wildlife interface. Okay. Thank you, Julio. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see. We can see. Okay, so I can go ahead. So thank you very much. My name is Ziv Noga. I'm the Secretary General of Prizod, and I'm thank you very much for the opportunity to present Prizod to the audience today uh, and to discuss with you and the panel discussion after it. So Prizod is an international One Health initiative, is led by science with the aim of prevent zoonotic disease emergence. So, one second. The initiative was launched not so long time ago in the peak of a COVID pandemic in January 2021 by President Macron, by, the, by France, uh, uh, received right away high support by the European Commission and the Quarpartite Organization, especially from FAO Director General, supporting this initiative. Um, and a little bit three years after it, we are today, uh, grew a lot. We have more than 240 members from more than 80 countries around the world. Uh, it's important to mention that 26 members are country members uh, of the initiative, plus then 215 uh, entities and organizations from different sectors, from academia, from research centers, uh, civil societies, industries. So really bringing a lot of expertise from the different parts and different sectors uh, and to work together for the same goal to prevent the future pandemic through the prevention of zoonotic disease emergence. So this is also the point where I invite other entities from all over the world to join us and to bring expertise and working together for this great uh, goal of prevention of zoonotic diseases. More information about it can uh, of 
up, apply it can be shared with you after it. So Friso has the ambitious of really uh, to develop a research framework to understand processes and drivers leading to zoonotic emergence in the context of the global change, as mentioned in the first presentation, taking in consideration climate change, uh, loss of biodiversity, or deforestation, for example. This will be required an in international and multi-sectorial co collaboration to study the ecology and evolutionary history of pathogen and host, and also taking in consideration social economic, social environmental mechanism that bring human and animals close together. The idea is to then to promote and, and to develop a code design strategies to reduce risk, especially in the communities and on the front lines. So we're trying to achieve these ambitious goals by uh, creating a common framework to implement and coordinate research projects, so violence system and operational projects to maximize the impact. We already start to work on a platform for data sharing. We'll explain a little bit more after it. And to have a resource center for decision makers. When they take decision, it must be based on, on science and evidence. Make sure that this decision will help to, uh, to develop policies to reduce risk of emerging zoonosis. So the first phase of this initiative was to create uh, the strategic agenda. This was done with an effort of uh, more than 1,500 experts from 102 countries from all over the world. And this is done through different workshops. And this exercise was a um, result in our strategic agenda, which is based on five pillars just in front of you. Uh, pillar number one, understanding zoonotic risks. Pillar number two is to co-design solution to reduce those risks. Pillar number three is to strengthen early warning system to detect zoonotic risk. Uh, the fourth one is to come with a prototype of a global information system for surveillance and early detection. This is mainly in community in the front lines. And the fifth pillar is a cross-cutting uh, really to support the other pillars and to engage stakeholders and to co-design one health solutions, networks, and policies. Quickly about the government, so to make sure this initiative at a very global level, bringing together so many different stakeholders from government to research, uh, to NGOs and, uh, and uh, industry, we need a structure. So in the last year, we also established the governing bodies of the organization. So we have the General Assembly, which is composed by the members. The president of the, of the General Assembly, it's uh, Dr. Papa Sek from Sene government of Senegal. The vice president is Suwa Pek Enjoy from the government of Thailand. We have the steering committee, I will explain in a second, which in charge of the five pillar working groups that I mentioned before, and the secretary to support the work of the initiative through the different working groups. Uh, this is our the steering committee, our board, and the importance to show you it's also a part of the demographical diversity is also it's divided in three colleges, the scientific college, the region college, and the civil society college. So really bringing uh, different sectors working together for the same goal. Um, a little bit about activities, I will not go into the details, but I want to give you a general overview. So uh, France, together with uh, initiating this uh, uh, initiative, also provide an initial uh, fund of 60 million, right now going mainly to two big projects, one called Preacts and the other one PPR uh, sorry, PPR Resod. I give you an idea regarding the uh, uh, pre-acts. It actually divided in three uh, sub-projects. Already two of them already launched uh, in the past two years, Africam and Asamco in 10 countries in Central America, uh, Africa, and Southeast Asia. And to give you an example of very much uh, how it's done in, 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 the, in the ground, uh, it's also taking into consideration community-based surveillance activities. This is another example from Gabon, and the project uh, was launched in 2022. It's still ongoing. It's really bringing the community, um, uh, train them in a surveillance system, and also to make sure they're able to detect uh, suspicious, 
and suspicious zoonotic cases, also providing them with communication means so they can actually uh, inform the authorities. So this is one of the examples, and this is done, as you see on the list on your on the screen uh, in different countries under the three acts uh, project, uh, sorry, the African and the, the pre acts projects. With regarding internally for Prizod, so as I mentioned before, the pillars, so we launched very recently the five working group that each one of them dedicated to, uh, to each of the pillars. Uh, this is composed by more than 100 experts from all over the world nominated by our members uh, to really to start working and to deliver the goals and the activities of the uh, pillars. Today is the deadline to nominate uh, experts to another working group. It's an international data working group with the idea of identify critical data types that Prizod require to achieve its uh, primary goal to prevent zoonotic diseases. Um, this uh, group will be uh, established soon and hopefully will be launch its work before the summer break. Another project that will be launched soon. It's a, a mapping uh, platform uh, that uh, of all or at least all the uh, most of the initiative activities, the uh, project and uh, that are existing around the world with focus on prevention of zoonotic diseases. So we identify around uh, 400 initiatives already existing. They are run now around 150 already on the website. The website will be open for everyone and also others can contribute and edit other projects. The idea is really to, to make sure that we have knowledge about everything happening around the world to be able to have to understand what are the gaps and also to uh, co provide synergies between the different project initiatives uh, with the same goals. Prizod is working in partnership uh, with the cooperative organization. We have a working group with the WHO on preventing future pandemics. Uh, soon we will be able to provide you with a report about the indicators that we are working on them right now. It will be presented soon. Um, we have a, a working group also with FAO. I will explain a little bit more about it, about return on investment of one health prevention of emerging zoonotic risks. And we are negotiating right now for another working group together with WUHA on one health governance and policies. So as mentioned, uh, we established a working group between Prizod and FAO. Uh, it's under the return of investment of one health initiative. The focus is on prevention of emerging risk. And right now the group uh, is composed by Marisa Per and uh, colleagues from FAO are working on drafting the terms of reference with this working group. We hope it will be finalized very soon and launch uh, quickly. The idea here is, uh, is will be a subgroup under the um, return on investment, one health cooperative community of practice uh, uh, framework. And the idea is to showcase the return on investment of prevention to influence funding of prevention and advocate for added value of prevention in international agreements. Don't worry, I'm not going, going into the details of this slide. And just to show you the pre framework for community-based surveillance, and development, and our co-founder and global science leader, Marisa Per, is part of an expert advisory group who will support the FAO in developing strategic framework for early warning and response to animal health threats. So everything was mentioned to you right now, it's really bringing the science, a lot of activities to work in the country's level. Uh, and uh, bring a lot of capacity, but also one of important issue is to work and advocate in the global level to bring the uh, the science into the decision makers process. And in this regard, the Prizod have this opportunity to participate in high level political events and really promote uh, Prizod and promote most important uh, prevention, investment in prevention of emerging of zoonotic diseases. I thank you very much for your time, and I'm looking forward to receive uh, to reply to your questions.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for <clears throat> very, very informative uh, presentation and highlighting the work of, of Presot. Uh, I think it's a very good example of a multi-stakeholder partnership at all levels, not only governments, but also civil society, research institutions. And, and, and as you say, more important, how this work is also reflected at the, at the community level. I think this is something that is, is coming out from these initial two, two presentations that we need to, to work also at the community level and to find evidence and, and, and good practices at that level to really improve the, how we can reduce the risk of emergence of uh, these uh, zoonotic pathogens. Um, thank you very much, Steve, and, and we will come back probably during the panel discussion to some of your points, but I would like just to move with the program and to, to invite the next speaker. And now we go to uh, some concrete presentation from countries, and I would like to give the floor to Brian Puno from Guyana, and and he is uh, the coordinator of the sustainable wildlife management program in Guyana. Brian, you have you have the floor. Thank you very much, Julio. Um, my, so my name is Brian, uh, and I will be presenting uh, the national network on um, sorry the national working group on zoonotic diseases related to wildlife. And this is basically a multi-sectoral platform which was established to assess risk and prevent outbreak related to wildlife in Guyana. So uh, in my talk, I will share with you um, five main sections. Um, so I would like to, sorry, six sections, and I would like to first introduce the National Working Group and then talk about the um, stakeholders engagement, risk analysis, our tools and guidance, and then uh, into public awareness. Um, so first of all, I would like to uh, say a little bit about the SWM program here in Guyana. Uh, it focuses more on uh, community-driven initiative that support food security and traditional livelihood. Um, it is being implemented in Guyana by the Guyana Wildlife uh, Conservation and Management Commission in coordination with C4. And in 2022, the program has added this result area we call One Health. And this result area was basically created to safeguard the health and well-being of people, wildlife, and ecosystems in the coastal and Rokununi regions of Ghana. So um, it brought together 20, 20 organizations, uh, which include international bodies, governments, institutions, civil societies. And these organizations are represented by 47 experts um, that serve as focal points on the um, platform. And it also formed a... a, a technical work group, which is now um, part of the One Health platform, which is facilitated by the Ministry of Health in Guyana. So the overall objective of this uh, national working group is to support local communities, governmental institutions, you know, with information analysis tools to better understand um, ways in which we can prevent outbreak. Now that you know about our primary target areas of the SWM One Health initiative in Guyana, um, let us move into part two, where I will offer a few interesting points on stakeholders' engagement. So uh, what we did was to first map our stakeholders. We identified the most influential stakeholders in the wildlife trade system. Um, and this include people like the traders, producers, farmers, um, consumers, academic scientific institutions, among others. Um, we also identify a list of civil organizations that represent the indigenous people and local communities um, that rely on wild meat and wildlife. So um, a list of stakeholders was generated and compiled from our professional network. Then we officially launched this platform. And next we developed TORs in collaborative manner, um, you know, as guiding principles for the roles and work plan of the working group. And this here, I present um, the overall um, platform, just a, a structure to give you an idea of who are involved, um, the people we worked with. Um, so after we formally established this multi-sectoral platform, which included focal points from all sectors, meaning the animal sector, health sectors, um, environmental sectors, civil societies, we then moved on to look at um, prioritizing and assessing risk associated with zoonotic diseases. And now we'll, I will share with you our experience in this section. Uh, looking at prioritizing and assessing risk associated with uh, zoonotic diseases, 
we realize that there is no documented list of priority zoonotic diseases at local and national level um, utilized for evidence-based policy formulation and effective implementation of uh, public health control measures and uh, activities. So the platform, we agree to prioritize zoonotic diseases um, that are directly transmitted by wildlife and wild meat. Um, in the absence of an official list of zoonotic diseases in Guyana, uh, several sources were consulted to develop an initial list of diseases. Um, prioritization was done for the first time in Guyana, and I'd say in the Caribbean region using literature review. Uh, risk prioritization tool and prioritization criteria um, in combination with the One Health uh, workshop. Um, here I present the risk prioritization tool that we developed to prioritize diseases. And then we use this criteria, the associated questions and the ranking score to rank a list of 50 zoonotic diseases. And uh, based on the way scored, we identify the top five zoonotic diseases for the coastal and Rupununi region. Uh, here are the top five diseases for the coastal and Rupununi regions. And uh, before I moved on, uh, I must say that these diseases were prioritized based on known and future risk of social, political, economic, and security impacts in human and animal health. Uh, conventional techniques such as the CDC method was very difficult to implement in Ghana, um, you know, due to the limita limitation with data on the burden of zoonotic diseases in the country. Then we published the prioritization of zoonotic, uh, zoonotic diseases of wildlife origin in a One Health journal. Uh, please feel free to take a look at it, um, which I present here, you know, in very short summary and in the interest of time. So in the next step, we are hoping to start assessing the prevalence of priority zoonotic pathogens in wildlife and humans uh, using PCR DNA analysis. So the goal of this study is basically to create a baseline uh, database for the country in order to improve its preparedness to prevent and respond to the onset and spread of uh, wildlife, wildlife borne uh, zoonotic diseases along the uh, wild meat value chain. Uh, in a separate study, we found that the top five most sold wild meat species on the coast are lava, bush deer, tapir, peccary, and uh, capybara. So more or less, uh, these are our targets. Um, Complementing to our risk analysis, we also conducted an ethnological survey to understand the cultural, social norms, and behaviors associated with uh, the wild bird trade that you know can shed some light on the pattern that influence transmission pathway for avian influenza virus and understanding local practices that may reduce or increase pathway for disease transmission and monitoring of disease at different level is important um, not only because you know it helped to prevent human health risks but also help to mitigate economic losses in the wild bird trade and also in the poultry sector uh, the findings of this study is currently being analyzed and we will develop a brochure with the results and um, will soon be available on our SWM website. Uh, regards to tools and guidance, um, to support the risk analysis, we realized that we need to develop protocols to assess the prevalence of prioritized pathogens um, in wildlife and humans. So we involve external partners um, to help us develop standardized protocols to test for rabies, gastroenteritis, avian influenza, and leptospirosis. Um, we also trained our uh, national lab experts um, from the Ghana Livestock Development Authorities on how to assess the prevalence of the uh, priority zoonotic diseases in wildlife using DNA technique. And these protocols were validated by the government as well. Um, through our focal points, and now they form part of the national surveillance system. So the country will be using these tools in the future to um, test for prioritized pathogens in wildlife and humans. And we also publish all the related, um, we will publish these related uh, documents on our um, SWM website as well. And finally, this platform has recognized the importance of including community members in shaping the activities and policies of One Health, uh, because we believe community network are essential in, uh, to implement One Health strategies. Um, the local people, they can serve as vital sentiments for surveillance, 
um, activities as well. So um, we, we thought about including them, but unfortunately, many of our indigenous communities, they are unaware of the links between zoonotic diseases, wild animals, and human. Um, to this extent, we have aired 10 radio programs, um, the 10 different episodes in the Rupununi regions, uh, mainly to raise awareness about these links. And this formed parts of our behavioral change and awareness raising strategy. The text um, from these episodes will be available soon on our Facebook SWM Ghana um, program web, web page. And in summary, the SWM program in Ghana has increased preparedness to, pre to uh, prevent and respond to uh, the onset and spread of wildlife borne zoonotic illnesses along wild meat value chains. And the National Working Group has achieved this by establishing the um, a formal One Health Technical Work Group, prioritizing zoonotic diseases, develop protocols to assess pathogen prevalence, understand transmission pathways of the avian influenza virus, and raising public awareness activities. And this brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. I am open to any questions in the uh, question and answer section. Over, Julio, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, for this very complete and nice presentation about your work uh, in Guyana, and the work of the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program in, in Guyana. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have so much time, then we need to move to the next speaker, but we will come back during the panel discussion with some of the points that you, you raised in your presentation. Uh, I would like to invite now Dr. Griffin Chanungu, coordinator of the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program in Zambia, uh, Griffin, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, are you able to see my presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, um, yes. my name is uh, Griffin Shanungu, and I'll be presenting to you the community perspective and practices on zoonotic diseases related to wildlife uh, and livestock. Uh, I'm uh, the site coordinator for Zambia, uh, working here in Lusaka, but mostly working in the Kazungula district in southern Zambia. Uh, to jump right in, uh, the program in Zambia really is focused on developing what we call community conservancies. Uh, community conservancies are basically uh, open areas where communities are allowed to keep wildlife in captivity or wildlife within their, their, their area. And uh, the community conservancy model is sort of uh, based on uh, four thematic areas. Uh, one, to basically improve uh, uh, income generation, uh, improve human wildlife coexistence, uh, contribute to global conservation concern, uh, and then also one of the most important is to, to recognize communities' rights to their resources. So basically uh, what we're trying to do is to really bring animals uh, close to where the, uh, the people are living and therefore they can also benefit from the animals there through, for example, uh, wild, wild meat trade, uh, ecotourism uh, activities, as well as uh, you know, supply of meat uh, from, from the wildlife resources. And uh, where we work at the moment is the Misa Community Conservancy. So the Misa Community Conservancy is uh, situated in uh, Kazungula district in Chief Nyawa's uh, chiefdom. And uh, it is uh, located south of uh, Sijifulo GMA or the Kafue National Park and uh, occupies an area of about 58,000 um, uh, hectares with a population of 135. And it's really situated within the Kaza region, which is the uh, Kavango uh, uh, Zambezi uh, eco region, uh, which is very, very uh, important or, uh, uh, for, for biodiversity conservation and has one of the largest or the largest uh, elephant population uh, in, um, in, in, in Africa. So it's a really important area for wildlife conservation. And as you know, uh, bringing animals close to where uh, people are, for example, a rewilding project uh, that we're trying to do in the Misa Conservancy, uh, we would definitely have uh, 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 aspects of zoonotic disease transmission between wildlife and uh, humans, as well as livestock. And uh, this uh, illustration uh, pretty much shows how the, the, the interaction is between uh, zoonotic diseases 
uh, from wild animals to domestic animals, and that can also affect humans. And also the vectors that can uh, spread these diseases, such as ticks, mosquitoes, and fleas, and also the uh, the the reservoir that uh, that that uh, that uh, harbor some of these uh, zoonotic diseases. But to give you a more practical example, for example, one of the, the studies that I, uh, I participated in a couple of years ago, where we looked at uh, you know the prevalence of uh, a bovine tuberculosis. In, um, in in wild populations of uh, of baboon in Lockheed National Park, so we isolated uh, bovine tuberculosis, and uh, the the the, um, the 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 bovine tuberculosis that was isolated uh, was previously reported to occur in humans and in cattle, and also in the leche kafu uh, leche uh, antelopes population within this ecosystem, and the finding uh, really just uh, intimates the probable cross. Uh, species transmission uh, of bovine tuberculosis in the Kafue flats. And this study also showed that, uh, 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 that there are potential implications of public health uh, and also raises conservation issues. So for example, we take this into cognizance uh, in terms of the, 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 the risks, the uh, zoonotic risks that, uh, that befall us as we are implementing our community conservancy and bringing wildlife to the, uh, to the area. So uh, the objective of the study uh, that was undertaken in April uh, this year was uh, to identify the diseases that affect humans and domestic animals and wild animals in Nyawa Chiefdom and in the Mesa Conservancy. I should mention that uh, this is just one objective of the four overall objectives that we want to undertake uh, at the, at the Mesa uh, Conservancy, which also include identifying local practices, um, assess prevalence of zoonotic and uh, animal diseases, as well as uh, ultimately develop and implement a plan uh, to reduce the risk of transmission and mitigate any negative impacts on the people, uh, domestic, and also the wildlife that we might bring in that area. So in order to do this, um, data was collected uh, in April 2024, like I mentioned, amongst uh, the people in uh, four uh, communities in the Nyawa Chiefdom. And these are comprised of about 79 uh, participants, and uh, uh, which which was comprised of 66 men and 13 women. And then also we held uh, key informant interviews uh, that were conducted amongst professionals to really try and get community knowledge. And these professionals included um, uh, local veterinary officers, the Department of National Parks and Wildlife, ecologists and vets, and other people from the local councils. So uh, this uh, it was a uh, uh, focus group discussions and workshops that really identified uh, the knowledge of the people on uh, identifying zoonotic diseases. So the approach uh, also took into consideration four uh, thematic areas, really uh, asking the, the participants in this workshop to, uh, to, to identify uh, diseases that are important in the area, and then also to, uh, to rank them in terms of importance as well as also uh, undertake some seasonal disease calendars, really trying to understand the prevalence of diseases within the calendar year when certain diseases are occurring mostly. And then also uh, to undertake some mapping where the local communities uh, know where zoonotic disease outbreaks are common and where they're not common. And then also to really look at the historical time in terms of uh, disease prevalence in, within that area. So uh, the preliminary results from this uh, study showed that uh, you know, quite a number of diseases uh, were, were identified. And uh, these included uh, diseases such as uh, corridor disease, black water, I mean, black leg and heart water, Newcastle disease and anthrax, and also other diseases such as uh, foot and mouth disease, uh, bovine tuberculosis that I mentioned earlier, and uh, rabies and other uh, uh, diseases that are quite common within that uh, within that ecosystem, and the communities were also able to prioritize these diseases. For example, corridor diseases was ranked number one, which is uh, quite common and uh, really affects most of their livestock there. I should mention here also that uh, the communities at uh, Mise uh, and Yao and Yao Chiefdom are mostly pastoralists, and so they really do keep a lot of uh, uh, livestock such as um, uh, goats.
that uh, um, communities prioritize the diseases are uh, based on outbreak frequency, economic loss uh, caused by an outbreak, and uh, and expense or uh, efficacy of the treatment of those diseases. And this sort of show that is uh, consistent with uh, research where farmers uh, who tend to rank diseases that cause dramatic sickness and sudden death than those that are more common but less dramatic, for example, like foot and mouth disease, which is really common in that area, but is a little bit less dramatic, and also the bovine tuberculosis, but is a very, very serious uh, zoonotic disease. Also, some of the primary results in terms of the seasonal drivers, uh, we did, uh, the committees also brought out really good information uh, with regards to, to diseases. So many diseases were not perceived as having any strong seasonality, for example, the, uh, the Newcastle disease and the corridor disease. Whereas some uh, diseases such as um, atroponosomiasis, which is a sleeping sickness, and anthrax and foot and mouth disease were associated with the hot and, uh, and dry season, excuse me. Black water parasites and tick-borne diseases were seen to be more common during the, the wet season. And they are common because most this is when most of the uh, ticks and uh, uh, flies and others um, are quite common during the rainy season. Also, some of uh, an interesting finding that we that that came out from this study is that uh, uh, government provided vaccines uh, were sometimes out of sync with the community perceptions about this uh, disease seasonality. For example, uh, uh, the vaccine for black water uh, uh, often is provided during the cold and dry season, whereas the outbreaks are more common during the wet and the rainy season. So, quite an interesting finding there. So, the spatial risks. Uh, so many species of wildlife. Uh, do sometimes frequent the, the chiefdom, meaning then that uh, there is uh, human livestock and uh, wildlife uh, interactions can be quite frequent in that area. However, the human uh, livestock wildlife interface is most intense and dynamic near the border with the GMA, like I mentioned, that was the north of the Mise community and the city of Flo River, an area where people and their lives have sort of shift towards during the rainy season when other areas are quite dry. So this really, uh, most of the communities congregate in that area and uh, you know to be able to, to, to have water sources for their cattle. And, and that also uh, causes a, a huge amount of uh, uh, disease outbreaks from that I'm end. Sorry, Richard, to interrupt you, but can you, can you wrap up, please? Uh, sure, yes, definitely. Okay, so uh, just to quickly move um, uh, on this one, I just uh, show you that, uh, for example, a lot of uh, the diseases uh, uh, mapping has been has been done, and uh, and also uh, a lot of uh, you know the historical timelines have, have also were also mapped, you know, uh, such as for example the um, the outbreaks of foot and mouth disease and uh, anthrax outbreaks, which quite occurred uh, uh, last year. And also, just to really wrap up, uh, thank you for that reminder, is uh, just to really give you the key key uh, uh, way forward in terms of the study that we're going to go through. So definitely you want to better understand what uh, prevents life to keep us from really uh, adopting uh, disease management practices. And then also uh, to have more knowledge and patterns of disease transmission, including understanding whether transmission is happening through direct contact between different heads uh, through contaminated forage or water sources from wild species would be beneficial. And then also lastly, uh, given that the unique disease risks that seem to exist during the dry season along the GMA boundaries, so we really want to focus on our investigation uh, into disease transmission in specific areas, and, and, that, and that would be beneficial to understand. So this is all that I have to speak, and I thank you so much for, for presenting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Griffin, for, for your comprehensive uh, presentation. And, and now we need to move to the short panel discussion that will be facilitated by our colleague Wondi from UNEP. Wondi, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. I know we have very limited time, so I, I, I hope uh, the panelists will keep the the answers to uh, also to maybe one or two minutes. First and foremost, thank you very much FAO for organizing this the day after World Environment Day. Uh, yesterday we had a huge celebration in terms of uh, World Environment Day of uh, you know, 3,700 events across the world, focusing on land degradation, desertification and drought resilience. Uh, uh, under the, uh, the slogan, our land, our future, we are generation restoration. This is also uh, a joint initiative in terms of uh, FAO uh, in the context of UN Decade on ecosystem uh, restoration. 
Now, quickly for, for Sandra. Sandra, thank you very much. I mean, uh, most of your presentation is really about the, the drivers of disease emergence, uh, but also it in its impact. So a quick, uh, very short question for you is, how do we do better in terms of prevention? What is that we need to do? Because prevention at source, sometimes we call it upstream or primary prevention at source. This is something fundamentally important. How do we do better on that? Uh, thanks. Uh, it's a very challenging uh, uh, aspect, in fact, because, uh, I mean, this pack, we, especially after COVID, uh, we all realize how prevention can be really more cost effective uh, uh, to, uh, in terms of reducing the direct and indirect cost of the uh, we still have very limited uh, uh, resources for disease management, especially in periods of outbreaks, and we have more and more outbreaks. Uh, so it is very difficult to direct enough in investments toward prevention. Also, because it's very difficult to convince of the effectiveness of interventions, which result is the fact that something doesn't happen, so which is very difficult to demonstrate. So. Uh, in my opinion, uh, based on our, our experience in the SWM program, uh, to better promote prevention in the work of FAO and partners organizations uh, using a one health approach, I would say that we need to actually continue to make the one health approach a practical reality uh, with training, collaborations, opportunities, case studies. Uh, and, and I believe that the creation of co uh, community of practice as presented by uh, Prezad, uh is very important. Um, uh, coordination platforms are also very important uh, to really uh, make a strong case. Uh, have an area where we can make a, a, a case uh, uh, on, on prevention. But also, um, uh, we, we, we need to promote One Health surveillance at the base. So where population can be trained and encouraged to report on all kinds of events that may affect public health. As this is information is really critical to take prevention measures at the roots of disease. We also need to advocate and support capacity building in countries, especially regarding animal health capacities, both public and private uh, uh, veterinary capacities with strengthened field epidemiology skills, so, which are really the first step to ensure early diagnosis can occur at human wildlife interfaces. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sandra. Yes, training, yes to community of practice, yes to advocacy. Then I move to Zivi. I mean, something you're so relevant is all this stuff, the good stuff Sandra talked about, how do we translate them into policies and legislation? Because it, it just doesn't happen in, in, in vacuum. We've got all these good ideas in order to make them happen. And I think we need the policies, the legislation in place. What can, with all the amazing stuff you you, you talked about in, in, in yeah. terms of you know understanding the drivers uh, the the five pillars you listed out in terms of uh, how we deal with this this approach but also the uh, return on investment advocacy beyond uh, just high level engagement how do we make sure that this can be translated into policies and uh, legislation. So thank you very much for the question. And uh, indeed, so first thing to do is to make the studies and to show results. And once you have the results and also uh, it's also how you communicate them, how you facilitate the understanding of them to the policymakers at the very global or national levels uh, in a way that it will be really appealing for them and understandable uh, to the point that will take them in consideration why they are uh, developing uh, the, the policies. So they're taking the science, the evidence, uh, and this is based on the results, but it's also based on the way we communicate it because science, it's not very easy to understand and not very easy for the policymakers, which are not always scientists, but they are the one who take decisions. So we need also from our point of view, Prizo, to be in between the science to translate it, to facilitate it to the policymakers in a way that it will be easier for them to take it in consideration when they develop uh, uh, the policies that in the future help us to hopefully prevent the next pandemic or the emergence of zoonotic diseases. 
Thank you very much. I, I apologize for rushing everybody because we have a few minutes in terms of dialogue, but I really like you, you made that connection between uh, policy and science and policy. And then I go to, because it really connects nicely with the next one in terms of Brian is, yes, it's great to have the science. It's great to have this policy, but how do we turn policy into action that policy science into action is actually what is so relevant in terms of uh, the One Health uh, uh, approach. So in your experience, I, I you know, would really liked what you, you, yeah, you, you talked about risk, risk analysis in, in what you've done in Guyana. Uh, I can actually flag something we've done, uh, Brian, within UNEP uh, in, in terms of uh, publication for preventing the next pandemic. I would encourage you to look at it where uh, where we make a lot of links in terms of uh, where this uh, future pandemics or in terms of uh, the links to the pandemics. But what I would be interested in is, is yes to policy, yes to uh, um, science, but how do we make the real connection in terms of actual implementation? And that also has, you know, the, the, the political leverage uh, in terms of, you know, the political level. Uh, and what are the barriers that we see, especially? What are the barriers in terms of uh, translating uh, One Health into action, uh, whether it is in the context of wildlife or, or beyond? Over to you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, so... I believe that in order to promote prevention at the political level, we must first identify the most important areas of concern and then begin scaling up um, current One Health projects. Uh, but the duties and responsibilities of all sectors involved in One Health systems should be clearly uh, defined at the political level in order to implement collaborative activities as needed. Um, from a political standpoint, I also think that it is critical to increase the literacy level across all sectors, you know, through simple means such as like disseminating information, uh, perhaps developing capacity building initiatives uh, to incorporate a One Health approach so that all sectors, they are fully aware of the key areas, um, the areas of focus and best practices. Um, research is also an important consideration. We need evidence to back up our judgments. And I say this because we need to invest more in research so that we can collect enough data from all sectors to effectively detect, respond to, and prevent disease outbreak. On this note, we can continue to build on existing activities of the SWM One Health platform in Guyana that focuses on zoonotic diseases. Uh, with regards to barriers to implementation of One Health approach in the context of wildlife disease management, uh, there's a lack of epidemiological and surveillance data to assist evidence-based uh, decision-making. Um, uh, additionally, I'd say that there are no specific law or regulation that speaks to One Health. I feel that if we altered our public health policy in Ghana to incorporate One Health uh, with clearly defined functions, then this would improve governance across all sectors involved at the human-animal interface. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Brian. Yes, so much research going on, but we need to uh, translate that that research into a more understandable context. Uh, in the context of you know the science policy action, I think mm -hmm. that is absolutely relevant. Uh, the, you know, in particular, you you emphasized on we need to raise. It, it's nice to have all these findings, but do people, the public at large, do they really understand? in terms of taking the action. Thank you very much. Right. And then welcome. Griffin, Griffin to you, the, the, the very last one. Uh, I'm, I'm happy you, you, you're you part of this. Uh, you know, Zambia is one of the, the six uh, Nature for Health initiative that you have together with so many other uh, partners uh, are, are leading. And the whole idea be, be behind it is really working nationally to prevent pandemics and related risk uh, by strengthening the environmental aspect of One Health. And I want to emphasize something on sustainable One Health approach. And I really wanted to know what are the barriers, really, what are the barriers in terms of uh, rolling out this, considering, I mean, looking at, uh, you know, Africa, wildlife conservation is a huge economic interest also. 
and and what are the barriers in terms of advancing one health yeah yeah thank you so much yes um so uh, for example uh, a lot of our our tourism uh, in terms of economic management depends on a healthy uh, world of populations you know most tourists come here to to see the big five and other animals but uh, you know, uh, and it also speaks very, a lot to wildlife management and the one health uh, aspect. Uh, but in terms of the entry point, for example, uh, is that uh, we, Zambia, developed uh, the one health strategy, uh, which is running from 2022 to 2026. And this is a very uh, strong entry point for us in implementing the one health approach because it took into consideration a number of players, for example, the Ministry of Livestock, and uh, Ministry of uh, you know Tourism and Environment and others. So it's a really, really good entry point. And so for example, any disease outbreaks are really coordinated uh, in, in Zambia. But some of the barriers, for example, in implementing this at a larger scale is really much the lack of funding. You know, uh, funding sometimes can be a, a problem, for example, to undertake you know comprehensive disease surveillances. Um, you know, to also to have a quick response to some outbreaks that, uh, that, that, that happened. For example, we had an outbreak of anthrax um, uh, last year and it took quite a while for, for, um, for a quick response to address the situation. But, but fortunately, I think that there is a lot of political will and policy direction towards really driving the aspect of one health and really preventing outbreaks of these zoonotic diseases. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Griffin. I know I, I'm, uh, we almost run out of time, but uh, what I can say before I pass it to uh, uh, to my friend uh, Julio is what uh, what we have learned is you know the relevance of ecosystem health, which is fundamentally determine uh, the hu the human health, understanding the drivers of uh, uh, pandemics and pathogens, the risk analysis that we need to do, uh, and in terms of funding, not only funding in the context of surveillance, lab capacity, human capacity, that is so relevant in terms of uh, addressing these issues. Uh, I, I know we could say uh, uh, a lot more on this issue, but we have a limited time. I'm sure our colleagues from FAO would definitely organize another event in terms of expanding this, uh, but in, in, uh, in terms of time, we're very limited, as I said. So I pass it on to uh, Julio uh, for the next step. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wondi, and thank you to all our speakers. I can see if you have your hand raised. Yes, uh, just to quickly reply to the question from the chat box, if it's OK with you. Yes, yes, it's OK. So the it's question quickly. is, since coming uh, from Sabiha, it's how is Prizot plan to address the reemergence of monkeypox virus disease? Oh. So just to mention that in general, uh, Prizot is very much focused right now on the mechanism of the bring um, to the facilitation for the spillover for the pathogens from animal to uh, humans. So we are not really focused on specific uh, diseases emerge or re-emerge, uh, we are focusing on a mechanism. Of course, now with the study of the different groups, as I mentioned, there may be the possibilities the expert would like to focus on different uh, diseases or these uh, pathogens. This will, they will be of course allowed to, to develop in the best way they think will allow them to deliver the objective of each pillar working group. But the idea is really to understand the mechanism of the spillover from pathogens from animals to humans. Thank you. Thank you, C, for, for that uh, answer. And thank you again, uh, Wondi and colleagues, for this uh, short but very rich discussions. And I think we need uh, some follow-up events to, to continue the discussion. And I would like just to uh, invite now um, uh, Tanawa Tienzin, the Director of the Animal Production and Health Division and Chief Veterinarian of FAO, to deliver closing remarks. Thanks, Tanawat, for your time and to share your the thoughts with us in, during this uh, webinar. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julio. And thank you very much, our uh, panelists and also moderator. I really enjoy the way that you moderate the sessions. And also, you really challenge uh, panelists to ask very difficult questions. And also, it's really, <laughs> it's really entertaining uh, to listen to all panelists and also uh, your uh, sessions.
instead of giving a closing remark, I know that my dear colleagues, uh, Julio, he also gave me the, uh, the closing remark, the paper, but I will not use it. But I have to appreciate for your, uh, for your documents that you prepare. I really appreciate, but I will use some. But I just would like to continue to share what I have heard from you when you're talking about how to build such a kind of interconnections between different sectors, public health, animal health, wildlife health, or environmental health. Because most of the time when we talk, it's very general, generic. But when it go to the field level, at the country level, I still remember when we have an outbreak of avian influenza in Asia. At that time, I still, I was working in Thailand at the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperative because my dear friends from Department of Forestry, they just left Ministry of Agriculture and have their own Ministry of Environment and natural resources. And you can see that when you're talking about One Health, actually it's about multi-stakeholder approach, how we work with our colleagues from different ministry, different sectors, different area of work. And that's why it come, is, is very, 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 very good example. We know that if you want to collect the sample from wild birds, I'm sure that my colleagues my veterinar uh, veterinar uh, veterinarian from the Ministry of Agriculture, they cannot go to the forest or to the uh, wild bird sanctuary and collect the sample immediately. No, they cannot do that because all the wild bird is, are protected by the wildlife legislation, which under the Ministry of Forest or Environment and Natural Resources. And that's why you need to talk between two ministries and you need to reach agreement. Ah, it is possible. Can you collect the sample? I will share the resource, the budget from my department. I give to you. You do the task, you collect the sample. And I know that you don't have laboratory to detect the avian influenza virus because Ministry of Environment, their work is more on conservation. They don't put their priorities on animal health or wildlife health. And that's why when we talk, we can say, okay, I take money from you to collect the sample. I submit the sample to your laboratory and we get the result and we solve the problem. And when you talk with a colleague from Ministry of Public Health, when you have the disease or people who have a suspicious symptom, similar to whatever avian influenza. You also need to share information and inform colleagues from Ministry of Agriculture. Or Ministry of Agriculture, you get the report and you detect the avian influenza in chicken. You also need to report and share information to the Ministry of Public Health at the ground level, district level, provincial level, village level. And you can start doing the surveillance together from both human side and animal sides, and even though colleague from wildlife and forest. And you can see that this kind of experience is a true experience that happened when we have a crisis. But we should not talk only when we have a crisis. We should talk before when we are free like this, when you are in the peace time. Julio talk with one voice and Julio go to talk with chef from pre, pre, pre sort initiative. Julio Hop have to talk with colleagues in WHO Genoa. How are we going to have a better preparedness and think about how to prevent? And when it really happened, how to have a rapid response? And everyone share your resource. And sometimes I can tell you, I'm sure that at the country level, or even though at the global level, 
Ministry of Public Health have a lot of money, a lot of budget. But Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of like uh, UNAP, Ministry of Environment have very little. But we don't talk about who have more and who have less. But we talk about each of us can bring the values to support each other through one health approach. The one who have more can share more. The one who have less in terms of finance can work more, can make more, provide more expertise that the other side, they don't have. And that's why this kind of concept, whatever we build such a kind of national committee, I tell you, there are many countries came to talk with me. Oh, now I have the national committee on One Health, but I don't know what I have to do next. I have a meeting, first meeting. Many people like to come for One Health because people see it as an opportunity to get funding. After six months, talk, 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 half of the room will not come. And next six months, it talk again. It's just only young staff. The director general will say, okay, now this one is just talk forum, just blah, blah, blah. They will not send anyone to come anymore because people don't see the values. When you talk working about One Health, you need to bring values, even those small values. I bring money. I bring my expertise. I share my authority to you that you can use my legislation to implement your work, that you don't have capacity. This one is a concept of One Health that not only One Health in the paper, we can have a joint plan of action, beautiful. You can write something beautiful. Huh? All the UN agency, we are so good in writing paper. And all the paper we put in the bookshelf. And after 10 years, we have so many books we will throw away. And it will link to uh, climate huh? because we have to burn it and have emission. And we have to cut trees because to, to produce papers, we need to cut a lot of trees. My friend from... UNDP will, uh, you, you not, we're not happy. And that's why we need to, to make it, it more action oriented at the ground level. Share experience, share resource, share data, share information. But in the real world, sometimes we, and we understand we are also competing, even though at the country level, competing about visibility, competing about resource, even though within among ourselves in the UN system, we know very well. But I talk from, from my heart, from my observation. Uh, this one, now is a time to act, as uh, Vu, Vu Sen mentioned. But when we act, something more practical, realistic, and need to understand the local context, country specific, their need is so different. Thank you very much for inviting me to join you. I'm very happy to meet all of you colleagues. And when you're talking about One Health uh, to prevent the pathogen uh, emergence and spillover. Finally, thank you to all of the participants for their attention, for your attention and also participation. Have a good day. Good evening. This one, at least I use the last part from my colleagues, uh, Julio, who prepared for me. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Tanawa. With this, we conclude our webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much.